Hey friends, my name is Zach, and I'm making a little game about a duck with a gun. This week, I thought I'd take a bit of a stab at the AI for the game. The enemies are pretty much the final piece of the puzzle towards getting a nice gameplay loop going, so it's pretty important that I get it done sooner rather than later. AI is such a huge dragon to slay, so I've been putting it off for a while, but I have done a bit of planning and a bit of testing. In the past, most of the AI I've made have been simple state machines or behavior trees, but this time I wanted to try something a bit different. I came across this really cool next gen technique called utility AI, where you basically feed an AI a bunch of actions and a bunch of inputs, and it'll choose the best to do at any given moment based on the parameters you give it. So I put together a quick little example to try it out, where a mob guy has to fend off hordes of ducks by shooting them. There's this, uh, this is a really weird bug though that I couldn't figure out where he keeps trying to, he keeps trying to Fortnite dance for some reason. Um, I think it just does that? I don't know. Um, anyway, he has the option between shooting, reloading, and healing. And I'm feeding in the inputs, distance to the nearest duck, ammo, health, and how many ducks are on the field. I then tell it how much it should want to do an action based on its inputs. For example, when ammo is nearly full, reloading really isn't a priority, so the action is given a lower score. But when the AI is on its last few bullets, the urge to reload is much higher, and the action is given a higher score. The AI does this for all the actions, and then calculates the score for each, and chooses the one with the highest score. Now the AI knows what to do in any given situation just by seeing which action scores highest. This is super cool because unlike hard-coded if statements, the utility AI will select the best action to do in between states too. For example, when there's no ducks left on the field, we can set the score for firing to zero, since it can't fire, and the AI can decide if it's best to reload or heal based on the action scores, even if they're both really low. Although it probably wouldn't be that difficult to hardcode this example, it'd get exponentially harder as you increase the actions and inputs. Whereas with utility, it'd be really easy to add new inputs or new actions. You could also mess around with the parameters and give the AI a bit of a personality. Say, if we wanted a more aggressive Rambo AI, we could set it to favor shooting more than healing. Or it could be more careful by setting it the other way around. Since we can make these parameters whatever we want, I was thinking it'd be super cool to try use a genetic algorithm to make the AI fight to the death against each other to try breed the best set of parameters. So press subscribe if you want to see that. No idea if it'll work, but uh, you know, I'll give it a go. So pretty cool, right? It's, uh, it's basically Skynet, which is cool for creating a smart looking AI, but gives us a lot less control meaning it'll take a lot of tweaking and iteration to get it playable. Since my mantra for this project is don't reinvent the wheel, I looked around for a good AI package that I could use in the project. Turns out there's not a heap of stuff out there that's actually finished and not really expensive, but I dug around a bit and I found this really cool package on GitHub, which is pretty basic, but got the job done and had some super sweet UI. It didn't really end up suiting my needs, so I rewrote a heap of it and now it's looking pretty sweet. But utility AI on its own can't do everything. For example, where should the AI aim? Where should it move next? How do you actually animate the AI to where it wants to go? I think this kind of makes AI a bit of a beast in that there's a lot of little problems you've got to solve and there's no one silver bullet to do everything for you. I'm still figuring out how to do aiming nicely, but for movement, the solution's pretty simple. We can use a similar technique to utility AI by pretty much just giving each possible position a score and going to the one with the highest score. So I basically have a heap of points scattered around the level that I call cover points that tell the AI where they can hide from bullets. So we can give them each scores and choose the highest to work out where to move. The question is, how should the cover points be scored? What makes cover like a good choice for the AI? Well, closer points are easier to move to and we want to be able to see the player's general area from the new point. And I guess we don't want to be too far or too close to the player. I think that'll work as a good base for now, but I'll probably change it later. But I want to focus on the visibility bit because that's what I ended up doing this week. So by visibility, I mean the AI needs to be able to check if a point has line of sight to where Ducko is hiding. Otherwise, it might be moving to a point where it can't shoot Ducko, and that would be pretty stupid. So we could do this pretty easily by shooting lasers from all the cover points to Ducko each frame to see if they have line of sight, but that'd be expensive. So instead, since the cover doesn't move, we can check to see what's visible from where in the editor and then save it for later so we don't have to keep doing unnecessary work while the game's running. So to do this, first I made a few separate points at different heights for the AI and the duck, listing all the possible places they can peek. Weirdly enough, the height difference between the two makes things a lot easier, since we'll never need to know if the duck can shoot other ducks and the AI can shoot other AIs. So we only need to store if the duck point is visible from the AI point, which saves a lot of memory. So I botched together an editor script that shoots rays from each AI peak point to all the other peaking duck points. 
Also, to save memory, instead of having a huge table or matrix to store which points are visible from where, instead I have a list of which points can see the current point, so if a point isn't in the list, we can assume it can't see that point. This all sounded great and super easy in theory, but took me ages to figure out why some of the points weren't working properly. I was racking my brain because the code looked good, and I even made a little visualizer to make sure the ray casts were working properly. It ended up being because I flubbed one line of code, and uh, worked great once I changed it. So, yeah, great. Anyway, all that nerd stuff's boring, so let's take a look at all the other dev I've logged this week. First, I added ragdolls to the enemies because, I mean, come on, you gotta have ragdolls. I then tested they were working by having it activate when this enemy went into cover. <laughs> and, uh, yep, looks pretty good. Since the ragdoll needs accurate colliders for hands and feet, I figured I'd also use them as a better hitbox than the stinky old capsule collider I was using before. I also worked on getting the enemy movement a bit nicer by adding in animations for standing cover. It still needs some work since I got bored halfway through and started on the visibility stuff. The enemy movement as a whole is still pretty jank since this is the first time I've done such a deep dive into Mechanim, which is Unity's animation solution. All the enemy animations use root motion, meaning the movement of the animation moves the character instead of just telling it where to move and at what speed. Which is awesome since it means movement looks really good and your character's feet don't slide around, but it means you're really at the mercy of how good the animation is. So you know how in most AAA games now your character does that kind of annoying thing where they don't stop immediately? Well, that's because they're using root motion. Fun fact. And sometimes it does this, which is uh... Yeah, don't even, don't even know how that's happening, so... Also, following up from the last video, based on the feedback, I decided to keep the crosshair compensation thing. But I'll actually implement it properly so it's not as jittery and I can control how much it drifts and in what direction and that sort of stuff. I'm thinking I might even be able to turn it off entirely for easier difficulties. I also added some crosshair improvements this week. Old mate Fraser had an idea I really liked and suggested that the crosshair should change to remind you that your cursor isn't accurate when you're behind cover. I originally thought that a circle could represent how much you'd have to move the mouse, but it ended up being pretty huge and didn't look very good. So after a few iterations, I came up with this. I might end up shrinking it a bit more later, but I think it looks pretty good for now. I also use a really fast lerp to make it hide and appear, and it feels really nice and snappy, which I think is important for a difficult game where you want your inputs to be really solid to make you feel more in control. It also appears and disappears when you're aiming, which feels kind of cool, and turns red when you're out of ammo. Even though there's an animation that plays on the gun when you're out of ammo, since you're more focused on the crosshair, it's really easy to miss it. I also made this little circle countdown to the reload animation. The idea behind all of this is that if you can see that little white dot without any red or anything, you know you can shoot right away and get an accurate shot. As I was making this, I thought it'd be really cool to add a run and gun button where you can shoot while running, but your shots are less accurate. I think it'd work really well with suppressing fire if you're changing positions and don't mind wasting a few bullets. I think it'd also just feel really cool. I was also thinking about a mechanic that might be a bit controversial, but I'm thinking about having a realistic ammo count when you're reloading. You know how there's that really bad meme about first person shooters where everyone reloads after firing like two bullets? Well, I kind of hate that, so I was thinking I could just give you a number of magazines for each checkpoint, so you have to choose between reloading a full clip or potentially not having enough ammo to finish the zone. And I know I can hear you say, but Zach, realism isn't fun. And you're right, it's not. But this mechanic isn't supposed to make the game more fun. It's supposed to make it harder. So I've got a little poll thing off to the side, so answer that if you feel like this would fit the game or not. Of course, you could also turn it off in the difficulty settings if you really hate it. I also added this sweet fire extinguisher, since you know any good warehouse has to have one. And while these Miami goons love breaking laws, they're actually very careful to uh, make sure they're fire code compliant. And of course, just like real life, you need them to go flying when you shoot them. So I chucked that in. It's just an add force at position call every frame with some added noise and particles. While I was making this feature, I was like, wow, it'd be hilarious if you could kill with these. So if the fire extinguisher is flying fast enough and it hits you or an enemy, it'll insta-kill you. Since the movement's pretty unpredictable, I think it'd be pretty hard to get kills on purpose, but uh, you know, it could create some pretty funny moments, so that's a win for me. Anyway, that's it for this week. Um, sorry it took so long, I've been finishing up with exams, and I just started a new job last week, so been pretty busy. Anyway, do you like it? Do you hate it? Any thoughts on the new stuff, or the video format, or whatever, I'd love to hear in a comment below, or on my Twitter. See ya.